A person sent me that video asking me why these pilots in the 747 were taking off going straight up in the air, and if I ever do that. Here's the entire video. This is a 747-8. We refer to it as just a Dash 8. The easiest way to tell the difference between a Dash 8 and a 400 is this. Look at the tips of the wings here. You can see right here there isn't a winglet. On a 747-400, there's a winglet there. On the Dash 8, it's just a smooth bend up, similar to a 787. The plane design is very similar overall to the 787 with the engines and the wings and there's a lot of things that are very similar except it has four engines making it twice as cool as any 787. This is a very windy day is what it sounds like and you can hear that from the person that's recording it as well as look at the rudder. You may notice the rudder inputs that the pilot is putting in here. Now that could be because when they lined up on the runway they didn't line up exactly straight and I've done that many, many times, and you line up on the runway, and when you're going five or 10 knots, it's really not a big deal. A lot of times you'll just use heavy rudder just to get the tire steering in the right direction because the rudder and the tire are connected. So it looks like big rudder inputs in order to get that happening, to get the plane going straight down the runway, but it could also be that they're getting ready for the possible wind. I, I don't know. My guess is though that the plane is very light on freight which makes the back end of the plane move a lot. And so you will see the rudder come into play more than you will in a very heavily loaded down plane, which is heavier on the runway. The other thing I'm gonna suspect is that the performance is calculated based on low level wind shear. There's an option when we're calculating our performance right here, you see low level wind shear. Essentially what that means is that the direction of the wind is changing a lot below 2000 feet. So below 2,000 feet, if the wind direction and power is changing a lot, that can impact your plane. So you're not gonna wanna take off and then have the wind maybe shift from a headwind to directly a tailwind. That can affect your performance as far as for clearing obstacles or other things. So it's important that if you have low level wind shear, you don't take off on a derated or reduced thrust which is normally what we take off with about 95% of the time. You see this here on this performance, you can see right here, it indicates a derated thrust takeoff. The reason the engineers design it that way is so that your plane is not working at maximum power all the time. Think of your car, if you're driving your car around and you're running it as hard as it can go all the time, well, then your engine's gonna die quicker. It's the same thing for these engines. The difference being when your engine explodes, you pull over to the side of the road. For us, it's a little bit more complicated if our engine explodes. So doing a maximum power takeoff and being very empty is gonna cause the airplane to pitch in this very steep angle right here. Especially, you'll notice it goes up even steeper once the gear goes up. The reason that happens, obviously the gear is creating a lot of drag. So when the gear goes away, then you're still pitching for an airspeed. You're keeping that airspeed as you're getting away from the ground and you can't go too fast because your flaps are extended. You need to get to a certain altitude and then a certain speed to retract your flaps. And there's a whole profile that we fly. And that's, there's two different profiles that we typically fly. But generally speaking, when you're climbing out, you're holding a specific speed. So when you're very light and the engines are going full power, you're having to hold that speed. And that means you're gonna be going up very steeply. And that's basically what you see here. And then when the, the gear goes up, that's a lot of drag. So in a lot of cases, gear goes away. That normally would be slowing you down. Now you have to pitch up even more to keep holding that speed until you get to an altitude that you can retract the flaps. And then you'll start speeding up. So you, you probably saw as it started to go over, the nose of the plane started to come over and that's to speed up in order to retract the flaps on a normal profile. Now I have done a few of these where you're basically empty and you have a low level wind shear. And when I had it, we were doing it in a very 
uh, wet environment and the back side of the plane was all over the place. You could feel it sliding back and forth and everything happened very fast. That plane is designed to take off close to a million pounds. So you can imagine being light on fuel because it's probably not going far if it's not carrying any freight, it's going somewhere to pick up additional cargo. So it's gonna be light on fuel, little cargo, and in this case, it didn't look like it was wet, but we had it, it was wet, and it was all over the place. So that very steep pitch you see is normal because of those situations. That's not a normal takeoff that you'll typically see uh, if a plane uh, like a 747 is loaded and doing a normal flight. That's why you don't normally see them do that. They're normally, it's a lot more shallow of a pitch because you're just climbing out fully loaded, just like a car going up a hill. If you're full of stuff, it's gonna take you a lot longer to go up a hill. Same with a plane. So there was nothing unsafe about this. It just looks cool and you just rarely ever see it. I said it before, but I have to say it again. Decision making is really what makes a good pilot. Aeronautical decision making. This obviously was a terrible decision. Even though pilots are typically judged on how smooth their landing is, it's the decision making that really tells you this pilot is good or not. And I'm not just saying that because my landings are bad. I say that because how are you going to turn on the propeller of a plane and not think that it's going to start moving forward at some point? That is a terrible decision. And at first I was thinking, maybe he hit his truck, that would make it at least a little bit less embarrassing. Then I just noticed the car in the background with the trunk open. So I'm guessing that this is actually his car. Now hand propping a plane to start is the way the planes used to get started back in the days. It's not very common right now. It's very dangerous to do because that propeller starts spinning really fast. So you can prop it and fall into the blade or you can prop it and not put chocks into the plane and it can drive over you. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So hand propping is dangerous to start with, but doing without chocks makes literally no sense at all. I actually zoomed in here to see where the plane was when they started it, just hoping maybe it jumped over the chocks, but I don't see any chocks in here, which means he thought that he could hand prop his plane, run around the wing and jump in it, before it ran into anything. Obviously that did not work out. He clearly gave up on that and then thought, I'll hold on to the right wing here and slow it down from going forward. But I think all he did is directed it into this person's truck, which is a pretty nice truck. And I'm hoping it's not the owner of the flight school, which means he's gonna have to go inside and tell them that he crashed his plane and his truck all within the last few minutes. That would be terribly embarrassing and you can see the anxiety that he has right here. As a flight attendant that I used to fly with, always like to say, common sense these days, not so common. As most of you know, I am not and never have been a fighter pilot, and that's probably a good thing because if you gave me an aircraft like that, I would be making some terrible choices. N not as bad as hand propping a plane without chocks, but still very bad choices. The easiest way I can explain what's going on here with the plane floating straight down while turning like this is witchcraft or sorcery or black magic. I mean, you can say whatever you want, but it's just craziness. I, what I think is going on though is that's not something you could do in a 747. Well, it's not something you could do in a 747 and then get out of it. What I think is going on though is as they're doing this, they're keeping the power up. You can hear the engine running in the background. It sounds like not at an idle power. I'm guessing here. 
I don't know, but it sounds like they're keeping the engines running, which means that it's continuing to suck in air at a lower power setting. So it's continuing to suck in air, which means the engine doesn't flame out. And then when they get to whatever altitude they want to go to, they can add additional power because the engine's still working. That additional engine is going to suck in more air and it's going to be able to power out and go straight ahead. That would never work on a commercial airliner. I can assure you, if my airline ever lets me take a 747 to an air show, you will not be seeing me perform this maneuver. At best, you might see me do a max blast takeoff like this one. Essentially, that plane gets to do way cooler things than my plane gets to do, but my plane does come with a bathroom, a bed, and free food. So take that, fighter pilots. The person who sent me this clip asked me, why are the windows open and do I do that on the 747? I don't because the 747 doesn't have sliding windows like that, which is probably for the best, knowing I'd probably forget to close the window at some point or I would fall out the window while I climbed out there to try to take some photo for YouTube or Instagram, I would probably end up falling out the window. So it's probably for the best that there's no option for me to have a side window like that. Something that this person didn't notice, which you might have noticed on my face, is that they're using the thrust reversers here, which basically means they're slowing the plane down with the engines instead of using the brakes. Now, different airlines have different rules as far as when you can use your thrust reversers. They may just be putting these in idle thrust, which essentially means the plane isn't being pushed forward by the jets. In some cases, the airlines don't care. In some cases, they do. The risk of that is by doing that, if you do uh, open them up and there is any piece of dirt or debris that's sitting on the ramp area there, it can get sucked into your engine and repairing that engine is very expensive. I'm not a car guy, but I guess the equivalent to cars, I'm going to guess here would be like using your transmission to downshift when you're trying to do something instead of using your brakes. Transmission, way more expensive than brakes. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but if you don't do it correctly, then you're downshifting to slow your car down, which will just to save your brakes is kind of the same as using this. If it works and it goes perfectly, probably fine. If it doesn't work or you're over shifting or not shifting correctly, uh, then you can run your transmission out, which is a lot more expensive. I can already see the car guys jumping in the comment section to tell me how wrong I am. So why would a pilot do this and open the window while the plane is still moving and they probably only had a two or three hour flight? They open the window because it's probably a really nice day outside, I'm guessing in Holland, and they're just trying to get some fresh air. Kind of like if you roll down the window of your car when it's a nice day outside instead of running the air conditioning or the heater in your car. It's literally the exact same thing. Or one of the pilots farted in there and it smells terrible. Both are very real possibilities. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.